meeting to order and just orient the committee. We, we're mostly going to be working on the water bill this afternoon, but um, <clears throat> we're going to try to roll out the plastics bill in order of sort of in a more regular order, which would include the bill's sponsor, and that's Senator Bray. And he's able to join us this afternoon, today, right now. Here he is. And um, <laughs> live. It's kind of like Saturday night. Live. And then we're going to transition so back to water. To you. Oh yeah, sure. For the afternoon, and then go into plastics deep the rest of the week, depending on how we land on water. We may need to rearrange, but I hope it's um, move, Alrighty. move forward on both bills. Welcome. Why, thank you. Nice to be back. Um, I like your new digs here. Very, very light and spacious. Yeah. Um, so S13, uh, um, thanks for taking it up. I'm happy to be introducing it. You know, it just, I have a little handout that I use with my own colleagues and I thought I should reuse, reduce, recycle, keep going with the same thing. So basically, you know, it's, what is the bill about? Before sort of getting stuck on particular details, it's really that plastics uh, have created uh, an environmental problem in terms of their over, overwhelming extent, variety, and challenges to things like recycling um, and environmental impacts once they are out in the environment. As you may know, they, um, for the most part, there is no natural um, critter, bug, microflora, microfauna that breaks them down and turns them back into the kind of constituent elements that just recycle endlessly in nature. They get stuck out there. The thing that happens to them is they just break into smaller and smaller pieces. So the last couple of years we've talked about microplastics and this year as part of doing S113 I learned to get another term, it's nanoplastics because when microplastics break down they become nanoplastics and by the time they're that small, the micron level, 10 to the minus 6 meters, they're so small they end up uh, entering tissues and we're starting to find that they are showing up um, in all sorts of uh, aquatic life for instance and we're seeing neurotoxic effects so um, there's a, a environmental and public health uh, side to plastics. We ought to figure out how to do better. And one of the maybe most egregious ways we use them is to use them just once and then throw them away. So the bill aims to reduce the use of plastics, particularly single-use plastics in terms of carry-out bags, uh, plastic single-use plastic straws and expanded polystyrene, also known as most of us as styrofoam or just foam cups, things like that. Um, so we work in, in uh, Title 10. Uh, we looked at a lot of models, but it included a, a Brattleboro's ban that's been in effect uh, in terms of the plastic bag ban since uh, this last summer. There's a uh, hundred other. Uh, 16 other jurisdictions that do it and many other countries around the world that all are managing plastics more um, progressively than we have to date yet in Vermont. So the bill does four things in terms of the uh, uh, regulates use of carry-out bags and it defines two categories, single-use and reusable. Um, and the goal there is to switch people from single-use to reusable. Um, and in part of the way it does that is on the house side there on the right, it prohibits the use of plastic less than 2.25 mils. Um, that number, as you'll find out, comes from California. Well, once again, California's uh, done a, uh, a lot of research and legislating on the issue, and um, they've ended up setting, for the most part, a quote-unquote standard around what do we mean by a durable plastic bag or a single-use plastic bag. The threshold they uh, came up with, and it's not without controversy. Some people think it should be a heavier number, a thicker bag, but it's 2.25 mils. And by comparison, uh, one of those really lightweight uh, single-use plastic bags that we all get, those are down to about 0.5 mils, so roughly a fifth of the weight. Um, and then uh, you can still, we're practical, you know, well, it would be great for everyone to show up at a store with you reusable bags with them, whether they're made of plastic or cloth. Sometimes you might forget one, uh, you don't have one, whatever, so there's a way to have a bag. Um, but it says that if you have a lighter weight bag, and it, so it wouldn't be plastic, it would have to be paper, um, it would 
but with light vapor paper, and that it says that the retailer should charge at least a nickel for it. So that is really, it goes all the way back to our 1971 bottle bill, where one of the signals you send to someone about stop littering, or in this case, stop using single-use plastics or single-use single -use bags, is to um, get people to notice and say, okay, if you frag your bag, no big deal, you're getting charged a nickel. But uh, the question is, can you get people to start to say, I don't want to waste a nickel every time, I'm going to bring my reusable bags back in with me. I think a lot of people already do this, but it's part of, um, of you know, a, basically a, uh, a, single, a signal to um, customers to try to remove your bag. The other thing is that on the retailer side, uh, there's a higher cost for a paper bag than a plastic bag, and so I think they actually like the idea that they ask for the ability to charge in order so that they not simply have to swallow uh, a more expensive substitute paper bag. And then the other thing too is that we don't, the goal is not to switch people from single-use plastic to single-use paper, it's to go from single-use anything to reusable. And, um, and that's part of that whole messaging between stores and consumers. Um, the second thing... I just have a question. Sure. So people could continue to use single-use plastic bags that are 2.3 of them? Yes. So why? Well, it wouldn't be, yeah, I think you would say, well, that's not a single-use bag. By the time you're 2.25 or above, and by the definition, you've now created a reusable uh, bag. Okay. Whether it's made of paper or, or plastic. So uh, heavy duty. Um, uh, the second thing is uh, you know, regulating use of uh, single-use straws. I think probably a lot of people have heard about how problematic they can be in the environment. Uh, a lot of straws are given away um, just by default. We know that some people need a straw because for one reason or another, uh, medically speaking, they need a straw in order to be able to drink. So we don't want to infringe on anyone's ability, of course, whether they're out, uh, to be able to take food or take, uh, take drinks. So um, it just says that you, you need to ask for one. So the default is that you don't get one. If you ask for one, you can get one. At one point, you know, we had discussions around uh, that this, because it was for medical reasons, should someone have to say, for medical reasons, I need this straw. Well, there's, it puts the person asking into a potentially awkward or stigmatizing position. And it also means that whoever is going to give you this straw are they going to have to judge whether or not you really ha have a medical reason for it? So we said, all right, um, based on testimony we took, we thought it was more graceful to say they're not by default. If you ask for one, you can have one. And um, the third category of uh, uh, things that the bill does is it regulates the use of expanded polystyrene uh, food service products. So that's anything from... Uh, the foam trays uh, that you can, uh, and so I should pause. Basically, the, the best example is like a foam cup, foam coffee cup or something like that. I mean, but there are other um, examples of um, expanded polystyrene that are allowed. We took testimony that suggested, for instance, what if your store receives in all its eggs an expanded polystyrene <coughs> carton? Well, so those are originating out of state. Um, we're, we're we wanted to make sure we weren't going to inter, uh, interfere with interstate commerce or make it hard for a store that's already sourcing from out of state, and that's the way they come packaged to continue to get what they wanted to sell. Um, likewise, there are uh, people packaging food in the state that have contracts out of state where the out-of-state shopper says that what we want is for our store is that all eggs come in expanded polystyrene egg cartons and you could continue to supply an out-of-state account with that kind of a carton but we're trying to uh, within state that we we won't continue to do that um, uh, sort of service but then the fourth thing and, and why so uh, just why pick out polystyrene uh, amongst all the things so the the precursor and for polystyrene is benzene which is one of the very few uh, chemicals uh, that the nine of 90,000 that the EPA has chosen to regulate 
which makes it sort of an all-star dangerous chemical. So it's a, it's a benzene is a precursor on the way to styrene. Uh, there are exposure issues around its manufacture and use, uh, and then on the disposal end, you end up uh, with potential exposure again, particularly if one of the ways that people dispose of waste is through incineration, and they release uh, uh, benzene again into the atmosphere. So it also causes a lot of logistical problems, and that it uh, it's the kind of stuff that breaks into smaller and smaller pieces and gets stuck to other things and mixed in with them. It ends up being a contaminant for many uh, MRFs, you know, the, the recycling facilities. So uh, for a variety of reasons, from health exposure uh, to contaminating waste streams, we uh, went ahead and uh, banned, for the most part, uh, expanded polystyrene. The fourth thing is, although all three of these things are, we, in our judgment, were clearly good things to do, we know that there's um, a much bigger issue on, on our hands with plastics. 50% uh, of all plastic ever made was made just in this century, and 50% uh, of that is related to packaging. Um, so we wanted to be able to, we create a working group um, in the fourth thing, the single-use products working group to make uh, recommendations on Chris, solid waste issues. Rewind. 50 yeah. percent of all the plastic is made this century, in, in the 18 years. Then. Yes. So 50 you, percent. You start that sentence over again. Sure. Well, so. if you go back to 1975 and to present day, uh, there's been a nine-fold increase, 900 percent increase in the amount of plastic manufactured. In this century, 50 percent of all plastic ever made uh, has been manufactured. And of that 50%, uh, 50% of that is just related to packaging. So uh, things that are uh, completely single use, right? You just open the thing and now you got what you bought. What are you doing with the, you have instant, you know, it's one use and now you have a uh, waste. So uh, rather than, you know, like most things, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Could we try to get ahead of creating so much waste and reduce it at the, from the beginning by having people think ahead about how they're packaging things? And so that's uh, what this 11-member uh, working group does that delivers a report by the end of this year. And it looks at, so there's, it does two things really. It's looking at um, how our solid waste system is dealing with plastic more generally, how this bill would fit into that. Uh, it gives us a chance to think through um, the provisions in the bill. And then it also uh, addresses the question of product stewardship. So I think people are all familiar that when you buy batteries or paint or um, anything with nuclear in it, like a thermostat, electric switches, um, we already have programs in place in Vermont that say, but the the manufacturer has an obligation to participate in how you handle that as solid waste. So that's why you can take paint to a transfer station or to the, the um, truck that circulates for hazardous materials <coughs> quarterly in some towns, however, however your town or region does it. Um, mercury and light bulbs, so all these things we've said, okay, we're, we know we're creating a, a, a hazardous waste that can be difficult to deal with. Let's think about it at the at the time of manufacture and bring the manufacturers into the discussion about how could you manage this better. Manufacturers, so what we've seen is we end up with better environmental outcomes at lower costs. And so it's a win-win for both environment and, and economics if you, and it's not a surprise, if you plan ahead, you're going to have less waste to deal with. So that same group says, let's look at product stewardship for packaging and see if we could work with uh, manufacturers to say, are there ways to think about what's gonna happen to your package once it's received by the person, and maybe choose something that's uh, less problematic uh, for the our solid waste programs to deal with. Um, so I have a, sort of an expanded version of this uh, uh, that provides a little more detail. So it's a, a basically sort of a cheat sheet to the whole bill. Um, but I didn't pass out the beginning because it has more details that could take us off, off track. So I'm happy to answer any um, questions on it. But 
that's really the lay of the land. Tries to say, let's deal with three problematic plastics in the near term. Let's create a working group that then looks ahead to how we can do better for the long term. Questions for Senator Bray? Senator McCullough. Yes, sir. Um, how, did, how was it, Senator, that you guys, that, that you um, landed on a thousand feet or more square feet of retail space um, uh, as a threshold for, for a bag ban? Sure. So I'll give credit where credit is due. When I started thinking about this issue this summer, I decided rather than just noodle it over, I'd, I'd go looking, uh, you know, using some online. Uh, like NCSL tools, who's already doing some plastic bill work? And um, New Jersey had the, the best model I saw, and so we started from there. So the, the thousand square feet actually is a, a holdover from that original construct uh, for the bill. I mean, we modified quite a few things, but that stayed put. Um, some people have said it should be smaller, some people have said bigger. Um, the, we ended up feeling like it was maybe a, an okay thing. The other thing, too, um, to your point, was because we have uh, both this working group meeting between now and the end of the year, and then our, the, uh, the bill itself doesn't take effect until July 1 of 2020, giving us a year and a half, 15 months to get there. We also knew there would be a full legislative session so that if we, if we all learned between now and next February, March, April, whatever, that there was something we could do better in the bill, we could modify the program. But this sets us on track to a default. And that long rollout, some people said, why would you have such a long rollout? And that was in, in part because of testimony we had from Brattleboro. They said, you know, we had a citizen's drive to get this a petition to the, I forget what their, how they do it, it's a select board or something like that, to the council, city council. Um, and then and then once that referendum happened that said to the city council, we'd like you to figure out how to do something by rewriting city ordinance, they went through a public process there again, and then they wrote their ordinance with a future effective date. Well, start to finish, it was 15 months, and the town manager who came in, Mr. Moreland, said he thought that one of the reasons that this law went into effect with really almost no hiccups whatsoever, no one ever got fined, it was a very, they thought it was surprisingly smooth. They said, because we'd had this conversation for a long time, everyone knew it was coming. All the vendors had a chance to source the appropriate bags or come up with a durable, reusable bag with a brand on it. Many people did stuff like giveaways. Um, citizen groups found ways to create bags to hand out. Um, and then we had testimony about people bringing uh, free bags to places like the uh, food shelves and pantries, stuff like that, so where lower income Vermonters might be, that they would find a way to get hold of free bags. So uh, all in all, we said, okay, this is one of those cases where we can set ourselves on the course, we can, gives us time to make adjustments if we see improvements, but we also won't surprise anyone and people will be prepared. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Senator Buffet. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Did you receive testimony from stores that have less than a thousand square feet? We did not. And those stores that do fall into that category, are they typically your mom and pop stores or not? Uh, well, we didn't take any testimony on so I, I don't know how I characterize them. They might well be, but I, I honestly I couldn't say because we didn't. Uh, we talked, for instance, to Vermont Retailers and Grocers Association, but as and so I know they have a very diverse membership. Um, but they didn't single out that threshold in particular, at least in the testimony provided to our committee. And uh, say, for example, if this would go into effect, uh, could a store choose not to supply any bags whatsoever? Uh, I see, I, sure. I mean, you can run your store however you choose to run your store. Uh, the only prohibited thing here is, you know, the single-use plastic bag, yeah. how they go you know, how else they would respond, uh, it would be their choice. One final mm -hmm. question. Does that relate to cleaners, dry cleaners as well? Um, good question. So dry cleaners are listed, but so, and you're, thank you for that question because it reminds me of something important around the bag. 
uh, around the bill, and that is it says a bag provided at the point of purchase. So some people said, um, so you're dry cleaning, I, I, at least when I've ever picked up dry cleaning, it's already in a bag from, it's done somewhere else in the process, mm -hmm. maybe even in another location. They're not taking your dry cleaning and putting it into a, a single-use plastic bag at that moment. Mm -hmm. And the important thing, I think, for that uh, in committee was that, um, not so much on the dry cleaning question, but people said, well, how about when I buy lettuce? I mean, I'm, they're always spritzing down the vegetables to keep them fresh and damp. I don't want to put the wet lettuce in with all my other stuff. Can I still use one of those likely produce bags that comes off the reel? And the answer is yes, under this construct, because you're getting that bag not at the point of purchase, you're getting it while you're out shopping. It's not something that someone's handing to you at the moment you're, you're paying for your purchases. Did you take testimony with all of those kind of exemptions? How much plastic are we really going to reduce if we keep, if we have all of that? Sure. So the uh, Vermont, as um, he did some research using a tool that was developed by a, a group down in Massachusetts that you know, Massachusetts I think, has done this piecemeal. Something like 82 towns now have done plastic bag bills. Um, and they have a, a tool that lets you put in your juris the size of the jurisdiction you're looking at and what will be the, the impact of it. So it estimated that Vermonters, if we behave like our neighbors to the south and Americans in general, I'm not sure if that's a good assumption or not, we use 332 million single-use plastic bags a year. We spend about $13.2 million purchasing those. We don't think of it as a purchase, but it's built into the price of goods we buy. Um, the greenhouse gas impacts of uh, producing that, shipping that, and disposing of it is the equivalent of taking 1,927 vehicles off the road for a year. So if you adjust our total electric vehicle fleet by the cleanliness or lack of cleanliness of our the greenness of our electrical portfolio, 60% or so. It's actually, if you had sort of a perfect implementation, it would be, it would be the greenhouse gas contribution would be more than all the EVs we have on the road. So um, that was just a single use plastic bag. We didn't have any other detail around what would happen on straws or other kinds of bags. So but the, that, the that Massachusetts was, one just was the point of sale less than 2.25. Right. Okay, right. Any other questions? Yeah. I, I quickly looked at the <clears throat> statute. If, if a, a um, grocer just bans the, who complies with this, yeah. but decides that they don't want to charge for the, for the paper bag, do they have that option or is it is that a required part of it? No, if the, any single use bag, um, well, so single use plastic is uh, banned by this, and single-use paper is allowed, but you need to charge uh, a nickel for a single-use bag. Uh, on page uh, five, uh, in terms of dealing with enforcement, it says an offense shall be each day a person is violating the requirement of this subchapter. Um, so. At what point? What what point does? Is that when the call is made? I mean, I, I don't, when does it begin? Does it begin in terms of when does the violation start? I so uh, a report to who? I mean, who would, well, I think so. The, uh, on the encouraging side, the Brattleboro, they their enforcement is consisted of. Uh, they had a conversation with roughly a dozen stores in town to say, you know. A day or two ago, um, the bag ordinance went into effect, and people said, "Oh, well, I wasn't quite aware when that was starting," and everyone fell into line within a, a day or two more. So they never they never levied any fines; they simply notified people, um, and that was their experience. But um, this is a standard enforcement provision under um, ANR's current police powers. So how they would determine it, um, I suppose that would be. How they would actually think about it in terms of implementing it, I, I would defer to uh, Legislative Council or ANR. Yep. Representative, what if a retailer and grocer said, 
you guys, we're going to hear from all. Oh, from all right, never mind. It, what, all right, then I have a question about a bagel. <laughs> but if someone makes you a bagel and you have a little little bag. Yeah. Uh, a little bag? You mean like I'm that? just meaning, a, you know, if you buy a dozen bagels in a big brown paper bag versus a bagel in a small bag. Uh, well, it's, you know, single-use plastic that we're that targeting. But no, regardless but you would of be size. paying a nickel for either bag. Uh, so if it's a, oh, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Is it a smaller yes, uh, it's a size paper bag? bag. <laughs> yeah, I guess, oh, uh, God. Uh, you might want to. Not point of sale. The, the person who prepared yeah. it for you puts it in there. Right. So, I was right. I mean, this is. Okay. We had said we had this same sort of question around. If I'm at the hardware store and I'm buying, you know, ten number six yes. bolts, you know, and I get it in a little, I put it in a little bag. It's like, or the other one was, I'm at the Vermont Country Store and I'm loading up licorice and this and this, and, you know, in all those little bags. Mm -hmm. So you can still use little bags. It's uh, as the chair just wrap it back around. Okay. So the critical thing that's easy to lose sight of is at the point of purchase when you're paying is someone then giving you your goods to carry out, putting it in a single use bag or not. I'll say one more question. Is, um, if you're charging the nickel for the paper bag, do you think that that will make people or do they find that then people ask always for the heavier duty plastic carry out because it's free? So there's the there's we don't specify anything about any reusable bag. I suppose it's possible someone would give away something free, but um, the point what we heard was that uh, for one thing, if we if you don't have any signal at all, the um, jurisdictions that said simply we're um, we're banning single-use plastics and then they're silent on anything else about what kind of bag. Uh, a, large percentage of people simply say, I'll take the free single-use paper bag. And then you end up with uh, more and more paper bags to deal with in the waste stream. So the idea is reducing the waste stream, um, both, whether from both paper and plastic. We're not trying to increase the use of paper bags either. And they, they also cost more. So there are some retailers were concerned that um, the single-use plastic bags are in the na neighborhood of three or four cents, and the paper bags in the neighborhood of five to eight cents. So they didn't want to have to be spending more without being able to recover costs, uh, which they could do. But I think for some people, they for some stores, they were a little uncomfortable. What if my neighbor decides to get free bags and I don't? Well, so it, this just simply creates uh, harmonized legislation across the state, and I think that was actually, if there was anything that drew um, people together on the bill that might not normally have been uh, in agreement on it, the idea of harmonized legislation statewide was a positive thing for people who, I think, frankly, maybe rather not have done anything, but they said if we don't want to have stores within a jurisdiction sort of competing with each other over free bags or not free bags. We don't want to have Middlebury competing with Bristol over at free bags or just not free bags. That kind of thing. All right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, My pleasure. For us to go. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs> not until we have more fun with the water bill. <laughs> well, there's all the all these bills, they have an infinite capacity to yeah. Yeah. provide entertainment <laughs> delight. Yes, they do. Thanks. It's working. Thank you. Um, Laura, what's the latest from Michael? I have not heard of each from Michael. Each one lines 13 through 15. Do you want a definition of administrative cost? You directed me to look at the municipal grant and aid program that's administered by the RPCs. I talked to Peter Gregory on Sunday. This is what he provided. Um, he did say he would like to look at the actual program documents. He didn't have it in front of him at the time. Um, so it would be administrative costs means costs incurred by a clean water service provider or grantee to conduct procurement, contract preparation, and monitoring, reporting, and invoicing. Should I move on? Yeah. On page two, 
um, in uh, the definition of clean water project in the natural resource protection and restoration language. Um, you wanted it to reflect that it includes natural woody buffers associated with riparian lakeshore and wetland protection and restoration. Moving on. You wanted a definition of co-benefit. I used uh, language recommended by Representative Dolan. Means the additional benefit to local governments and the public provided by or associated with the Clean Water Project, including flood resilience, ecosystem improvement, and local pollution prevention. Should I move on? Um, you can go to page three. This was the clarifying language of when, after a listing, where the secretary was supposed to include the strategy for returning the water to compliance with the water quality standards. <laughs> so it's, it shall include in the implementation plan for the water a strategy for turning the water to compliance. And then um, in the previous draft, there had been language about what the agency would do if there was insufficient or no data. You asked me to look at this federal standard. The federal standard is if there is insufficient data or no. <laughs> that's what I mean. That's, I'm sorry, but that's the standard. That's a relief. I'll wait to get yeah. it. You don't have to go any further. Um, that cleared up, please. Yeah. Uh, then on page three, line 17, again clarifying where the strategy um, or is going to be included. It's going to be included in the implementation plan for the water. Um, on page four, uh, for the allocations, you wanted to be clear that they were going, the goals and the five-year pollution reduction targets are going to be checkpoints to gauge progress and adapt or modify as necessary. Should we move on? Page five, line eight, that's just correcting a reference. It had said chapter, so it should have said subchapter. Page seven, the reference. I thought that the discussion was you were going to have the agency check to see if the sub TMDLs were part of the larger basin or should be dealt with um, as sub TMDLs. And that's, I, I have a note uh, sub TMDL. <coughs> I just know for a practical basis, the Lakeshore Plain TMDL is over 10 years old, predates the Lakeshore Plain TMDL. The Lakeshore Plain TMDL does, make, does not make any reference to no, Lake Karma. Lake Karma. Yeah, I'm sorry, Lake Karma. And, and the Lakeshore Plain is, um, implementation plan makes no reference to uh, specifically to the Lake Karma. <coughs> So, so they, uh, fundamentally are two distinct videos. So, so the policy question is for you. Do you want to make a reference to it, or are you satisfied with page 5, line 7 through 10, 
that it's going to be part of the schedule um, in all other previously listed impaired waters. We did have a discussion on Friday about this. Um, my note still says include Carmine, but I think we might have decided to leave it out. Yeah, I Matt, do you remember? Yes, for the record, Matt Chapman, General Counsel Agency of Natural Resources. So I, I think I reflected on Friday that it was not the agency's intent to include all sub jurisdictional walk TMDLs in this, and that we would consider them as a part of the planning exercise in subdivision two, um, and that, that would in no way um, inhibit our ability of moving forward with those TMDLs, just like we would, would under their current process, but that it wouldn't be using the tools in this sub-chapter to do so. So, so um, yes, and, and I wasn't certain what the committee's final take on that was. It's good to hear of you reiterate that. It's in the record now twice, and when we um, get pushed back on the floor, we get the right answer. Okay. Like, uh, question the uh, do other sub sub TMDLs would potentially include the stormwater impaired waters, but they are required as part of the Lake Champlain TMDL to be updated with phosphorus control plans. So how would how would the stormwater impaired TMDLs get in the Lake Champlain TMDL so be um, treated? There are elements that serve multiple purposes. So the stormwater TMDLs have flow management plans for purposes of their stormwater flow-based TMDLs. Those MS4 communities and, and other sort of elements that we've used to implement the stormwater TMDLs will also have to have phosphorus uh, control plans with respect to how they manage phosphorus in those areas. Um, Two TMDLs, two different requirements, one permit. So it, this, uh, this affects sort of how the agency plans and implements the larger strategic goals with respect to TMDL implementation, not how permit requirements get implemented under all of these different programs, generally speaking. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Matt. Thank you. What's the rationale for leaving out Carmine but yet including Lake Mifremagog. Is it the size of the watershed? No. Lake Mifremagog is also phosphorus impaired and has its own separate and distinct TMDL. It is not in the Champlain Basin, so Lake Carmine is in the Champlain Basin. Magog is not. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say, again, that we aren't making efforts to improve the water quality and undertake efforts with respect to Lake Carmi, it's just that we're not using the tools in this sub chapter to do it. Okay. That's reminding me of why we got into including Lake Carmi in number in the sub number two. Because you know you're saying it's not really part of the Lake Champlain one because it falls through the cracks. Why don't we just say including Lake Carmi? I thought that's where we left it. Let's include Lake Carmi. Is it in there? Am I not? In sub two. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, is that not the agency's intention? Yes, it is the agency's intention in sub two to include the requirements for the power in there as well. Including Lake Carmel. Yeah. Page four of the original five lines five, seven and ten. Again, Jerry, again. Uh, page five and referring to section B two, which is seven through ten. Okay. Just to call out a shout out to Lake Carmel. Is that gonna be C or you're just folding it into two? It's, it's gonna be right here. All right. Mm -hmm. So on page seven, 
Uh, this is the first you'll see of references to 925 being changed. 925 used to include all four grant programs. There are now four grant sections. 925 is now just for the water quality restoration grant. Um, moving on from there. So E, you wanted the secretary to periodically review a pollution reduction value or design life established under the section at least every five years to determine the adequacy or accuracy of the pollution reduction value or design life. I've been under likely the mistaken idea that pollution reduction value was a quantifiable amount and that the design life was the length of the of the project <coughs> maybe even including O and M. Um, why would we be using or instead of hand? Um, you can say and. You're using the conjunctive versus the disjunctive. I think that works. Yeah. <laughs> I'm staying right out of out of the uh, sentence structure because I'm not good at that. But I'm just wondering, are they if they're two different things? Then uh, you. I think I think you want to use the conjunctive. If that's I think. Yeah, they are together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Conjunctive Okay. Should I move on? Yes. You just want to make sure you put it in the end of Where is this? One, three. On page eight. Yes. Yeah. And where? It says or design like the gap. So you can see. Okay. Now I think there you want an or. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Bottom of page eight. Uh, this was clarifying um, when, for all other waters, the secretary is going to assign that clean water service provider. And so, for all other impaired waters, the secretary assigns the clean water service provider no later than six months prior to the implementation of the requirements scheduled by the secretary under subdivision 922B2. So, remember, right above, that they're going to have a schedule for doing all of the, the requirements. Um, and so six months prior to that, they designate a clean water service provider. Moving on. Yes. Um, you wanted to be clear that an entity designated a um, clean water service provider uh, shall be required to identify. It had previously shall be in consultation with the Basin Advisory Council required to identify. Now that the Basin Advisory Council is no longer advisory and is making determinations on its own, you wanted that struck. You want to verify to be um, to be placed in here instead of monitoring. Page nine, three, so funny. Um, you wanted to clarify that uh, that the secretary is going to provide 30 days notice and comment for the guidance. It's going to provide clean water service providers regarding implementation of the chapter. And on page nine, line 14 and 15, that guidance is going to include how to account for the co-benefits provided by a project. Should 
Okay, move on. <coughs> Page 10, line 4, you struck the progressive before accountability. And now it's the secretary's strategy with respect to accountability. <coughs> And then on page 10, line 14, you are going to see many highlighted Basin Water Quality Councils because it used to be Basin Water Quality Advisory Council. You wanted the advisory removed. I'm not going to reference that every time we go by it. If that's okay with you. On page 11, line 2, it had previously said and selecting activities to meet a pollution reduction value and the first change you wanted you wanted activity to be changed to clean water project and then uh, pollution was changed to pollutant for conformity with the, the previous references to the reduction values you also wanted the co-benefits provided by the project and the operation and maintenance of the project to be part of that process. Should I move on? Yes. I have a question for you on page 11, line 11. I wasn't sure what you wanted, at least the design life or the duration of the design life, I was unclear from my notes what you had agreed to. It was, what was your, at least the duration or? Well, it, it was previously the duration of the design life and then I think you wanted it to say at least the design, I have at least the design life mm -hmm. as my note, but I'm not sure huh. if that's what you wanted. So, at least the design line? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Sure. All right. Um, page 11, line 13, that uh, 1389, that used to say 1391, so it's just a um, change in that regard. Line 15, changing pollution to pollutant. We can now skip to page 13. In the accountability subsection, you wanted the uh, ability of the secretary to uh, assess penalties to be struck from the accountability provision. You should be aware that because of language you added in, you amended section 8003 to include this as part of an enforceable a and program, they have penalties. They have the ability to, on page 29, line 6 through 13, they may take action under this chapter to enforce the following statute, rules, permits, assurances, etc., including 10 BSA Chapter 37, water restoration goals and targets. So if there is a, a failure to comply with the requirements of this subchapter, ANR does have enforcement authority. And remind us what that is. So they have the ability to assess a penalty of up to seventeen thousand dollars a day, with a max of one hundred and forty-five thousand. Um, that those numbers are established because uh, those are federal minimums for enforcement of the Clean Water Act. They would likely never reach that number. Did you say 140,000? 145,000. And that doesn't mean that after that amount, the that there's no enforcement. After that amount, it goes to the attorney general. It's more. It's a little different than that. I mean, there's a decision to send the enforcement to the Fair attorney enough. general at some point yeah. when the significance of it is significant. Can you just remind us what section we're in on page 29? 
Okay. On page 29, you're in section, I believe it's five. Mm -hmm. uh, line six through 14. Right, but I just know like what's the, what is this section doing? So all of a Enforcement Authority is in one chapter of law mm -hmm. instead of setting out its enforcement in the, the multiple chapters of law. Mm -hmm. um, we set it out once in one chapter and then just cross-reference those, those chapters of law that are enforceable under the enforcement chapter. So. By cross-referencing 10 BSA Chapter 37, including water restoration goals and targets, he made that subchapter enforceable. So then, if we if we uh, are going to do what we thought we wanted to do, which is remove penalties. Um, earlier in the bill, then on page 29, uh, line 12, uh, sub 5, um, we would either just delete sub 5, this is a question, um, because it pertains only to the water restoration goals and targets, um, it would seem. Um, we're not messing with um, with uh, enforcement for for regulated for the regulated community, because this bill deals with the non-regulated community, and it would seem to me to be okay there. Um, if we wanted to keep it in there, we might add water restoration goals and targets within the regular non-regulated community, um, but. So um, I'm throwing that out as a thought, but before the committee pushes around an awful lot, or I go any further and need your, your thoughts. We need subdivision five in there because that's how wetlands law is enforced because chapter 37 includes wetlands law. Well, I think when you, when, he, when Representative McCullough said delete, I think you meant the new language. <coughs> I meant, meant the new language, absolutely. Yeah. Because it is the non-regulated community that we're talking about in this bill. Uh, um, so the clean water service provider becomes a regulated entity. And so it's whether or not you want A&R to have enforcement over the clean water service provider. I think what we were striving to do was not have penalties, financial penalties over the um, service providers and sub penalties. Um, uh, I think that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, that is what we're trying yeah. to do. Yeah. And, and, and we haven't done it. Apparently, well, if this language stays in, we haven't done it. Yeah. So you could just give the agency equitable relief instead of monetary fine authority, if you would want that. Equitable? Say that again. Equitable relief. They can they can obtain an order from the court to direct that the clean water service provider um, engage or conduct a activity or remedy. Yeah. They need that? Isn't that what the other steps in this process of moving toward enforcement are? Um, that's a plan. That's not a court order. Okay. I think what we're, we're talking about fundamentally is about risk and management of risk. That these are discretionary projects that they're managing, the service providers managing. And if they fall short in getting the dollars on the ground, you know, who bears that risk? So, and one strategy may be um, the ability to call back that money. Um, so say that you're a service provider, you think you can achieve a certain amount of pollutant reduction, but you fall short 
because you can't get those landowners to participate as well as you thought you could. So you're still sitting on implementation dollars. Why can't you, as part of this, be simply a matter of an, an assessment of progress or lack of progress and a, um, a uh, crawl back, or however you would describe it, of the remaining funds, implementation funds for, um, for repurposing? Or something along wouldn't, those wouldn't you already have that in the grant agreement? Wouldn't you have a condition that if the funds aren't spent or implemented by a time certain that that, uh, that they're going to be returned? When we write our grants, we do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And what if the money's spent and there's... Well, it can only spend up to 15%, so again, that's a check right. on trying to prevent the, you know, the winnowing away of the implementation dollars. But it seems to me that that may be the cleaner way of trying to, instead of applying a fine related to trying to get discretionary projects implemented, maybe it's a matter of calling out that kind of assessment for the purposes of repurposing those community implementation dollars. You know, another alternative would be to identify when would you have gross negligence, something I kind of alluded to in the last, at the end of last week, you know, when would you want to have a fine-based approach and it's when you either have gross negligence or, the, or you're signing dollars for low, lower priority projects you know, that um, aren't based on any type of priority um, or some other um, you know, purpose. But I, I would think that the risk of going that direction of trying to establish you know, the terms of gross negligence, maybe they could simply in this, in this language indicate the that there is a risk of repurposing those dollars away from the service provider. I might have a more, I'm struggling with, so they don't meet the pollution reduction goals. There's a lot of reasons that they might not meet, meet the pollution reduction goals, including increased pollution from other properties, and that the, aid, the secretary's calculus on the, the ability of these projects to meet those goals is way off. So I just, I really struggle with this section. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't see how you can expect these people to be held accountable for like delivering on, oh, there's less, and where would you test? How far downstream from a project do you anticipate you're going to test for where these where the pollution reduction happens? Remember, they're testing on the the modeling results of that pollutant reduction project. So there, it's it's what's happening upstream or downstream, or the that may in fact result in a degradation well, like of water. They're testing. They're doing water quality monitoring. Not the service providers. That's no, just ongoing. The secretary. Yeah, yeah. but it's that's taking not enforcement this, against the service provider. This is based on outcomes of a modeling exercise to determine pollutant reduction by that project. So, did it was it built according to design specs and engineering specs for to achieve those reduction? I'm not sure. That's where is it? Say that? It's based on modeling. Well, I mean, it talks about that. But it is about the outcomes related to that project. Well, um, notwithstanding the, the modeling um, discussion, um, I've said it before, I still am. I'm concerned that, that the modeling itself may not be accurate, which is another, in fact, maybe the chair mentioned, um, that's out of the control of the service provider. Um, there may be other things that are out of control of the service provider. So I'm being redundant now and repeating what the chair said. Um, but I want to add that these fines in here, it's not going to be easier to find service providers um, with that 
um, black cloud hang over their head is a possibility. In fact, I'll suggest it may actually make it significantly more difficult for anybody to raise their hand and say, yeah, I'll put my my RPC on the line for $140,000 in case something isn't right. And um, you might want to check for some people in, in the, uh, who, who represent potential service providers who are in the room here to uh, comment on that thought. And I, I just have to go back to my question, which is, I think I might have found the language Carrie's referring to, but I want to be sure that that's what everyone is agreeing to, which is that the modeling is the basis for deciding whether or not a clean water service provider is achieving their pollution reduction goal. Okay. Mm -hmm. If, if I may add, uh, know that that by the state continues to monitor annually the pollutant reductions in situ, you know, actual monitoring, testing, the water quality, especially at the mouths of these tributaries where you have TMDL. So that will be ongoing. And now we'll determine whether in reality are we making a difference in these investments. There's also built into a TMDL a requirement to deal with future growth that could have a eat away at the progress you're making. Okay, so committing back to then McCullough's point of is the is the monetary enforcement piece of this kind of a showstopper to get clean water service providers to sign up. Charlie, would you like to comment? <laughs> I would love to thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so speaking on behalf of the Chittagong Regional Planning Commission, and, and I believe all the RPCs statewide, this is a stopper issue. I'm sorry, Charles Baker, uh, Executive Director of the Chittagong County Regional Planning Commission, for the record. Uh, this is a stopper issue if we're treated essentially as a permittee now. We're willing to be a partner with the state, but not a regulated entity. And this, from my read of this, essentially makes us a regulated entity uh, with this addition. Um, and I can tell you my board had a very open and broad discussion of this, uh, well represented from all the municipalities, a lot of number of select board members in Chittenden County. They are not willing to take on this kind of liability uh, to help the state with this issue. Sorry to be so blunt. Thank right. <laughs> We appreciate it at this point. Um, okay, so. Yeah, and what we talked about was like I know I keep repeating myself, but this the six month check in. <laughs> you know, um now we want we want those service providers to be as successful as they can be. And um, Right. So right now we're talking about are we deleting the enforcement part of this or are we going to include the enforcement part of it? That's the question on the table right now before the committee. Are there thoughts from other committee members? Okay, you are back to page 13. And line 13, this is the Basin Water Quality Council section. Advisory was removed whenever the term was referenced. That takes you to page 14. Line 17. I'm, I'm just lagging technical because you took out technical and you put technical back in. <laughs> and you took it out and then you put it back in. So it's just. That bad. So. That's all we did, right? Sorry, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, I missed it. Uh, so moving on to page 15, you wanted the. Uh, Clean Water Service Provider and the Basin Water Quality Council to be able to invite support from AOT staff and Agency of Commerce and Community Development staff. The U.S. is, uh, we abbreviate U.S. Um, when used as a federal uh, entity, um, and that's, that's really the only change there. That's the question I do have is like, the inviting of state agencies. We don't have to invite them. We can tell them to support it. 
Uh, yes, you can say that they shall have the support of those state agencies. Um, you can't compel the federal entities. I also don't know what the administration's position on separation of powers would be on this, because I don't understand the administration's position on separation of powers. Um, whether or not this would be foreseen as compelling an executive branch agency to provide services to a non-executive branch agency. Um, so that's one reason to retain invite. Mm -hmm. I see. Because UVM, isn't it? Because UVM what? Is a, is a non-executive branch? Uh, UVM is UVM. Yeah. Um, it's a state entity for some things. How it has incorporated other components of it would make it not a state entity. Um, my concern is that there's been discussion and vetoes where in the past where an executive branch agency is compelled to provide staffing to a non-executive branch agency. And so the non-executive branch agency would be a designated clean water service provider. Um, and the executive branch agencies would be A and R, agency of ag, transportation, etc. So can you compel them? Could you compel UVM? Since UVM is the state entity when it wants to be and it's not when it's going. Clean water service provider component. Right, but that's why if the invite is there, I think that mm -hmm. avoids all of those issues. But, yeah. but the legislature can compel them to, to, to provide staff to clean water service provider. That's what I'm doing. Again, if you consider the Clean Water Service Provider a, a legislatively creative entity for filling that role, therefore filling an executive branch role, then I think you can compel them. But if you don't consider that Clean Water Service Provider an executive branch agency or fulfilling an executive branch function, there may be an argument that you can't compel an executive branch agency to provide Service. I don't agree with it. I'm just telling you what an argument may be. And to avoid that argument, you just say invite. They don't want them to say no. Well, they can always say no. You tell them they have to provide support. You tell them things to do all the time, and they say no. Well, okay. <laughs> Pardon? Just have to do it. Right. Such a way of making me love this job. Okay. What does the committee think? Yeah. Invite. I like invite. Yeah, me okay. too. No. Mm -hmm. Moving on. <laughs> Um, section 925, this is, you're now getting the four grants broken out into four different sections. The first is going to be the Clean Water Service Provider Water Quality Restoration Formula Grant Program. Um, and it is for those clean water service providers. It is based on the annual pollution Reduction goal established for the provider multiplied by the standard cost for pollution reduction. So if you are a clean water service provider, you get this grant based on that formula. Going down to 926, this is the Water Quality Enhancement Grant Program. This is a competitive grant. It means that you may apply, but you may not get it. You wanted this to be available um, not only in, to protect high quality waters, but to restore degraded or stressed waters. You see that change on line 18. 
Moving on to page 16. Representative McCullough. So procedure question. Mm -hmm. We're doing a walkthrough of this of this uh, right iteration now. Um, you may want to be adding to something to 925 and 926. Will we do that later? No, I think we can do that now. Thank you for asking. Yep. So Michael under and committee under 925. Um, The, the uh, water quality enhancement, that's 926. Um, yeah, that's right. 926, um, you might want to consider uh, including all waters, not just those that uh, need to be restored, um, have been degraded or stressed. Um, and and, and the, you know the rationale for that is it helps with the all-in approach, mm -hmm. um, which is vital um, for statewide water quality, and it's equally vital in my in my mind um, and my as David Dean would say floor ears because we, we want as many of our House members to be all in as possible. But that's rationale. The, the, real, the real thing is we want to include water quality from uh, in, in these other areas of the state. Uh, so that, that's section 926. Uh, and one, also, in the Water Quality Enhancement Grant Program, um, we want to fund, additionally, want to fund and protect um, and improve other kinds of, of uh, enhancement, not just restoring degraded or stressed waters. So, again, not just already polluted, um, but I think we want to include other waters uh, it, more emphatically than we've got here. Uh, it's one way to achieve your purpose to strike high quality on page 15, line 18. So it'll be competitive grant program to fund projects that protect waters, restore degraded or stressed waters, create resilient watersheds, and support the public's use and enjoyment of state's water. So the protection isn't conditioned on high quality. We did get, the whole committee got language from the water. Um, that was from Mary. Uh, oh, right. Right. Yeah. Oh, that I'm trying to reproduce <laughs> here. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's saying it's what Mr. Groban said us on behalf of multiple organizations. But that works on my 18. Yeah. Crossing, crossing up high quality and that includes all water. Maintain or improve water quality in all water. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that um, Council Grady was suggesting simply as an easy change would be to simply drop high quality, so with an effective addresses our waters, where it would be line 18 that protect waters, restore degrade or stress waters, create resilient watersheds and communities, and support the public use. I think that was your suggestion. Yep. Correct? Whatever you want. I like protect all waters. Well, maintain or improve is a little different than that. Than protect. So that's maintain or improve is getting at that concept of of anti degradation that you don't want to allow anti you don't want to allow de degradation of the water. Yeah. Have to maintain or improve it. It, it tries to get after it, it's four general categories of water implementation, restore, protect, maintain, enhance. 
And that's what it's trying to do. Right? You can't just get to restoration if you only protect. So do you want to say protect, maintain, or improve water quality? Right. I think it would do it. Yeah. That would do it. And you're, you, it's implied, therefore, that it's in all waters? Oh, no, I would include that okay. as well. All right, should I move on? Yes. Representative McCullough, did you have something in 927? Um, no. Okay, so 927, I renamed. 927 and 928 had been the two stormwater programs, stormwater grant programs. So 927 is now about the three acre impervious surface implementations, because that's all it's there for. So that's what it's called, and it shall fund or provide fin financing for, which was a request that you had, projects related to the permitting of impervious surface of three acres or more under 10 BSA 1264 G3. My only question is, that, is that what it's going to be called, a three-acre grant, or is it a developed lands grant? I only say that because yeah, I, whether I, it changes from three acres to two and a half acres, we will be back, I guess. I, I, I thought about developed lands, but I thought you might not like that because that concept includes operational stormwater per, permits. But I think developed lands would be fine. Um, if you still tie it down to the permit for 1264 G3. Yeah, I've only heard that permit referenced as developed lands general permit or a three acre permit. I don't know what the name is that the agency is settling in on. Yeah. I call it the legacy stormwater permit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'd like to develop lands, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you want to call it just a developed lands program? Or do you want a financing program? Yeah, so that's fine. Financing? That's what it is. Um, okay. So on page 16, line 16, this is the Municipal Stormwater Implementation Grant Program. You wanted this to be tied to the specific permit programs under 1264 that you wanted to fund. So it's um, through by grants to any municipality required under section 1264 to obtain or seek coverage under the Municipal Roads General Permit, the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems Permit, a permit for the pervious <coughs> surface of three acres or more, or a permit required by the Secretary to reduce the adverse impacts to water quality of a discharge or stormwater runoff. Again, the three acres you might want to reflect develop plans. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding the last adverse impacts of water quality of a discharge. It's the language in 1264 for basically residual designation. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. And I would still use the three acres there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't use developed lands there because multi-sector general permit that's about developed lands yeah. right well so. i still don't i would not like to see funding with this the funding we've been talking about go to compliance with those existing permits whether it's multi-sector general permit construction or operational um as you'll be paying for someone's compliance um it's that three acre permit or whatever it's called <laughs> and i think is uh makes sense so, so i i use the general reference to 1264 on lines 19 and 20 but i could include specific references to the subdivisions for each of those so to tie it down to I'm, I'm concerned about just calling it developed lands without referencing like we did on page 16, line 13, the specific subdivision. Because developed lands to me under 1264 is more than just three acre. Yeah. Um, 
So I can do it either yeah, way. Yeah, I defer to your recommendation as long as we're, we're not allowing um, permittees under those three permits to access. So you don't want multi-sector, you don't want operational, and you construction. I think that they are out of the reads right now. Okay. Um, so page 17, lines 8 and 12, that's just renumbering based on the new sections. And that allows you to skip to page 21. Uh, and this generally is how the BHCB um, proposals, um, their first proposal to add to the findings and purpose section for the Clean Water Initiative, the reference to um, that it is success in implementing the Clean Water Initiative depends on the permanent protection of land and waters from future development and impairment through conservation and water quality projects funded by the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust. And then you'll see that, um, that to avoid the future impairment and degradation of the state waters, the state should commit to continue funding for the protection of land and waters through agricultural and natural resources conservation, including permanent and SMP acquisition. So this language is what VACB recommended. I think it makes sense. Um, I think this is what they're doing, the permanent protection of land and waters for conservation and water quality projects. And it's a policy decision for you to make the statement success that the Clean Water Initiative makes. Depends on it. Um, and to avoid future impairment and degradation of state waters, that is a federal requirement, the anti-degradation mm -hmm. requirement. The state should commit to continue funding for protection of land and waters. Again, that's a policy statement. It's up to you to make that statement. Um, but it's fairly consistent with your existing appropriation process and federal law. Shall I move on? Comments, Representative Dillon. Yeah, I think this makes sense. I like, I like this because I think what we were hung up on last week was well, about the Clean Water Fund and whether it had any oversight on how capital funds are being used. But since this is tied to more the Clean Water Initiative, which is or does involve all funding sources for clean water, I, it, um, I think it works adequately for our purposes. But there is more. <laughs> On page 22, to clarify that priorities language and how it works, you'll see that the directive to the Clean Water Board to recommend expenditures for appropriation from the Clean Water Fund will be according to the priorities established under subsection E. So those those priorities you were you've been talking about, which you were talking about on Friday, about how the money moves out first priority under an equal priority system and then a second priority, and that is just for the clean water fund. Then to clarify the use of the clean water project term, which now is a term of art in, in subchapter 37, it's going to be water quality projects that provide water quality benefits, reduce pollution, protect natural areas, enhance water quality protections, et cetera, et cetera, through capital funding, be funded by capital appropriation. So that reflects all the programs that the state does fund the water quality through capital dollars. With that said, I was in uh, house institutions over lunch, and they one of the, the issues they put on the table is whether or not they remove the directive for the Clean Water Board to make recommendations on capital dollars. Their concept was that they put this in when the capital dollar funding went from its traditional level of 10 to 13 million a year to 20 to 25 and they needed recommendations now that the capital dollars are down to its traditional level of around 12 to 13 they're questioning whether or not they want the clean water board to be involved in these recommendations um, mr 
question. So, I, so just so Mike had to leave to go to another engagement, the testimony went on in house institutions. Um, and so the chair authorized me to come in and tell you that the particular provisions that, well, I can tell you everything, but they took an informal poll of the committee and were over there. they found this language to be accepted. The language in our draft. Here. The language you see before you in this draft. Um, and then they also reviewed language that you'll be coming to with respect to uh, a study portion. And we can talk, I'm happy to talk about that when we get to it. Um, I do hesitate a little bit, and I, I appreciate your perspective, where this language has the Clean Water Fund recommending to the Secretary of Administration expenditures for water quality projects. Does uh, And typically what has happened is that they've been much higher than that. They're not, am I reading that wrong? Um, in that the, the budget reflects programs and grant programs, not necessarily down to the project level. So help me, maybe I'm misinterpreting this language. So in the language that I had drafted up over the weekend, I had water quality programs or projects okay. that provide water quality benefit. That might make sense to say programs or projects. It's just because you, you typically the legislature hears back the progress we've made by implementing projects, but at our level, we shouldn't be dictating or having budgets dictate or drive all the way down to a project level, necessarily. So programs and four projects can work. Okay. All right, should I move on? Yeah. So that takes you to page 24. That's just now the cross-reference to the four grant programs. Um, and then on page 25, um, this is in the recommendations, what the Clean Water Board will recommend. Um, they will recommend capital appropriations for the permanent protection of land and waters from future development through conservation of water quality <coughs> projects. Should I move on? Yeah. So, um, page 26 in the first priorities for uh, what the Clean Water Board's recommending for funding from the Clean Water Fund. <coughs> you wanted to be clear that each of the subdivisions A through E um, will have equal priority. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the following grants and programs, is there a missing one point four or five? Sure. Yep. Um, you wanted verification to be added on page twenty-six, line seven. You cr correcting the cross-reference to the um, section nine twenty-five adding ag water quality programs after the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Previously, you were just giving money to the Agency of Ag, and this is to clarify what its use is for. Water quality enhancement grant, cross-reference change to 926. And what you don't see is the priority language requested by um, VHCD because I think everyone's now agreed that they don't want to be listed as a priority under the Clean Water Fund, because that is non-capital dollars. They want to continue to get capital dollars um, as recommended by the Clean Water Board. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
Does that mean that none of their, I mean, if they have a project that they could get non capital dollars if they have they a project could. that fit those criteria and they went to a clean water service board? They could. Um, and they could get, if they qualify for any of the other, some of them are not grant programs specific to a clean water service provider. Right. So, should I move on? Representative McCullough. So, uh, two things, and I guess maybe I would back up, I apologize, page 25, line 10 to 12. Is that the language, um, and this would be a question for Matt, that, that you uh, worked out with DHCD? Just, I mean, it's, it boiled down to that, that sentence? No. The language that we worked out with DHCD is primarily on pages 22, uh, sort of straddling between 22 and 23, clarifying that the priorities established under, um, clarifying the priorities for the Clean Water Fund and how yep. the, the Clean Water Board will make recommendations with respect to capital yep. allocations. Yep. And then also as you move forward, notwithstanding Mike's um, note that it's an A&R proposal, when you get down to the study provisions at the end, A and R and DHCD have agreed on the set ten that is, is noted as the A and R proposal. And, that's okay. and, and thank you. You're welcome. Um, and so now back to um, real time, uh, page twenty six, um, line thirteen, water quality enhancement grants. Um, should be at least one and a half million dollars. Um, I'm bringing, bringing forth an idea from uh, the NRC that that number, that threshold number, uh, might want to be as much as five million dollars. And uh, I have no idea of uh, really the rationale for that, but there is somebody in the room that does. I bring this forward for this guy. And, oh, and, 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 and just to be sure that I understand, this is not talking about capital bill dollars. It's my, under, my, my thought here. Is, and is that accurate, Michael? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to propose that it be $5 million. As a threshold, Representative Squirrel. Actually, it's a question for Matt. I mean, you shifted these grants and sort of we shuffled things through here. My question is, we're showing 15, at least 15, uh, 1.5 million dollars for water quality enhancement grants. The iteration before the shift, how how much money over here on that left side would fall into that bucket now? So because I don't know what the justifications for that five million dollar so, so nor do nor do I. Uh, uh, so I think what what this doesn't what the sort of underlying um, the sheet that I provided you last week shows where we're at with respect to clean water funds today. And right now in the clean water fund there is it's actually slightly more, but it's in the range of ten million dollars. That amount of money grows over time because uh, uh, I assume, assuming the committee on ways and means either raises money when this bill gets there, that it grows over time, and there will be more money that we would allocate to these various programs from the Clean Water Fund. So what I didn't provide to you, and, and this is a part of the budgeting process, is. We've looked at it, we assume that that 1.5, that's a floor, not a ceiling, right? So it's, we intend that that money will grow over time just like um, money will grow under the restoration grant program and in other areas of the sort of major grant programs that the agency proposed in that crosswalk. The agency would be concerned having a $5 million floor of spending on an annual basis because again if we're just looking at uh, a FY19 
in the monies we currently have, that means you'd be spending $2 million to deal with pollution reduction efforts in the Lake Champlain Basin and $5 million on enhancement work, um, which we would, we would be concerned about. Because you have to shift, you only have $2 million in money if, when you shift the money around, that's what ends up happening. Right, and you can see that behind you, the Clean Water Board's final budget from, well, that's just 2020, but, um, You'll see that the anticipated revenue as of December 21st, 2018 was $6 million, with the carryover of 1.1. So there's about 7.1 there. So if you were at, had a minimum of $5 million, you would just have what Matt just said, $5 million gone to this. Bankrupt the other programs. Awesome. But, yeah, John. So my understanding was this is when the fund is, as Matt said, this is going to go to ways of me. This is not based on this year's money and how much is in the fund right now, but it's based on having at least 15 million because right now we have money from the property transfer tax surcharge. You have money from these sheets. Uh, we understand that there's going to be eight to ten million dollars. That's the goal to add to that. Um, and it's going to grow, and that the secretary is calling for five more million dollars next year. So that's that was how we were looking at this, not today, you know, in this moment today, uh, because this program doesn't exist today, and it won't exist actually, even if you pass it for at least a year. Well, the current funding level is typically around. In reality, it's about. Five million plus the sheets, so you're talking about six or seven million as we described. The floor you talk about, if that's envisioned currently, that's 1.5, and it represents about 25 percent. So another option is to use a percentage basis. So wherever you end up with the Clean Water Fund, you dedicate a percentage to ensure that it provides um, statewide funding for clean water. Mm -hmm. What might that be in your mind right now? Well, um, it, then, you know, it's, in this case, if you used six or seven, and that was your floor at 1.5, and maybe you would argue that that's too, too low. Um, but that's about 20%. But if you decide that um, you want it at, say, 25%, um, at $10 million, that's a floor of 2.5. And that's a floor. Again, you're yeah, just trying to. Yeah. <laughs> because you are trying to float four different funding sources that is. Uh, and Clean Water Fund and Capital Funds right now are the only funding sources in town in the state. So um, you think a quarter. At least a minimum of a quarter of the funding available is um, dedicated for this funding source. That really makes sense. Mm -hmm. Would it be a, a percentage of the total of the clean water fund or just part of it? Because right now the total is 15 million, right? Even though it's only 10 million. Yeah, so if you end up increasing it, <clears throat> I mean, so I was using the clean water fund, not, not the capital, and that current well, funding clean, levels. Clean water fund, Fifteen million. Yeah, but that's a that's whole of eight million. Shortfall. Yeah. That's short of it. So I was looking at more of a current actual position. Uh, One point five is a percentage of current levels. But if you could you could do it that way too. You could say, well, if your goal is is um, fifteen million for this year. And decide on the floor. It's just math, just deciding what your floor would be or what percentage makes sense. What do folks think about the idea of a percentage of the clean water fund? I like that. I like that. Is it? About how up, they just crush a few ideas. Is it have more standing if it's a percentage or not? 
The HCB is supposed to get a percentage every year, and they never get that percentage. Mm -hmm. If this the other thing is, as these as these clean water service providers roll out across the, the state, which they will, you know, this day, does that change how we feel about this conversation? As everyone gains more access to the other you know, formula funds, that, that's going to change how we feel about how we allocate the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I guess we're all trying to balance these priorities, knowing that we have a heavy lift to restore these degraded waters, but we want to provide a, a minimum amount of funding available for statewide priorities to fix our local water quality problems. So whether it's, I, I think we could decide a range. Um, I just think, you know, what, what, what's our gut feeling tell us? I think. Um, 50% seems too low, 20% we're getting okay, and but you could argue that 30, 35% may be too high given the amount of lift we have on expensive projects from agriculture to um, stormwater impairments. So that's where I, I arrived at somewhere like a, a quarter of the money, or you could say a third, but that's where my gut is telling me. Or you could give a range. You could do that. You could say you would expect a range of okay, somewhere between four. Well, I'm okay. Okay. Well, um, so my recommend was what the NRC did, um, which was five million a floor of, <coughs> um, and we've heard their rationale. Then I was jumping on the percentage thing, but when when when, when you, Amy, said, well, as other grant programs grow, maybe a percentage thing will be going somebody's ox elsewhere, if you will. I hear not quite your words, but, and I go, yeah. Um, so then having a monetary floor, a number, which can grow, according, uh, uh, certainly, as Matt pointed out, um, I think is a better idea than a percentage because we don't really know, right, at the moment we don't really know how these programs are gonna compete with each other and they will be for the finite dollars. Mm -hmm. So to put a percentage in, well, on one hand seems good, and I, but I think a hard floor there is good, whether it's one and a half million or whether it's five or something in between. Um, I'm still sticking with five, five million because um, they're one of my favorite agencies. So. Well, I, I, you know, five million or 15 million, if that's our 2020 is a third, you know, that's where I got that one third number to, and maybe that becomes a clause that we expect to move. 30% of the funds be available statewide <coughs> to address local statewide water quality. Can the committee support five million? I don't understand the impact of it. How, how does it fit in for where we have our priority list? But is it impacted by that list? Where does it fit? It it fits in that it's the second, no, actually it's the, the fourth listed one, but they're all given equal priority. So basically what you're saying is that this has to be funded first with 5 million or 15, 1.5 million, and then you can go on to the others. So you, you will be, you potentially, depending on how much money is there, are impacting how much money goes to the other program. So that, that's the $24 question is uh, how, much money? how much money is there. Right. And mm -hmm. We don't know. I mean, that, we, don't, we don't know that answer. We don't, but we could 
respectable. We know that. I mean, we know that if the recommend is 15 million, we know it's a short call date. We know that if the governor's recommend it was the date, that the EPA said we like that. So now it's not there. Yeah, but right. taken out. So the assumption is that 8 million is going to be found somewhere, otherwise the EPA is going to have a problem with our agreement. So I, I like the idea of a percentage, whether it's 25 or 30 percent of the clean water fund. Not a dollar. Is the percentage of floor in your mind? That's what I was thinking. Or percentage would be the floor. Okay, yeah. yeah. Which is the same concept totally, only it's expressed in percent. It's a little loose, a little more flexible. Yeah. 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 I like Carrie's like idea. Maybe 25%. You like Carrie's idea. The percentage is about to Yeah. Yeah, I think 25%. Hearing 25%. Yeah. Percent, yeah. Percent, yeah. Percent, as a, as an at least. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then move on. Page 27, line 10, is, um, conforming cross reference. Page 28, line 17 through 19, we're going to change the name of that grant program. Um, can be developed lands grant program. Mm -hmm. uh, page 29, you struck section 5. Um, page 29, line 21, you included verification uh, in the list of uh, activities that the um, RPC is authorized to do. Um, I think you should add that also on page 30, line 13, um, for the <coughs> conservation districts, consistency. Verify. Yeah. Uh, then you corrected a um, erroneous cross-reference to the Regional Planning Commission's on line 14, should be the Natural Resources Conservation District. The nutrient credit trading language, page 31, lines 3 and 4. You wanted the report to include information on the cost to develop and manage any recommended trading program. Page 31, line 14 and 15, those are just conforming cross reference changes. And then section 10, you have VHEV's original proposal on page 31. And then ANR's responding proposal on page 32. As you heard, I was not there when the institutions committees made its decisions about funding. Um, I'm making recommendations for capital appropriations for water quality conservation programs. Apparently, others were. So. <laughs> 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 so, page 31 to 32, the two different proposals. Yeah. And for clarification, I think I heard you came to an agreement. Did I understand that you and the HCB came to an agreement, Matt? You on did. this language? You did, Representative. And is one of these that agreement? It is, Representative. The, 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 the uh, provisions you see on page 32, beginning on line 15, notwithstanding the fact that it's okay in our proposal, yep. um, the ACB and the agency agreed to that language. Yes. That's a slam dunk for me. I'm sorry, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> I was being I'm not <laughs> So, so the, the, the one that's titled A&R Proposal is actually an agreement between the Agency of Natural Resources and the ACP. So page 32, line 15. Okay, so who wants to walk us through this? Uh, you asked if I want to. <laughs> 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 Please, <laughs> I'm inviting you. <laughs> there we go. Uh, nice. So, um, 
this is, is basically a study and a report, and it, it does in the first sentence have language similar to what the HCB proposed previously that the state's success in achieving and maintaining compliance with the water quality standards depends on depends on avoiding their future degradation and impairment. You've seen that language already. It's, it's included in the findings for the Clean Water Initiative now. And then the permanent protection of lands for multiple conservation purposes, including for protection of surface waters and prioritized for multiple values are an important component of this work. Again, that's something that's built in effectively into the findings for the Clean Water Initiative. And then you get something similar on page 33, lines three through five about the state's success depends on, on strategic land conservation. Then you get to the secretary, and that's Secretary of A&R, right? Yes. Um, shall convene a stakeholder group, which reports back to the General Assembly on it before January 15, 2020. Recommended framework for statewide land conservation that will maximize both water quality benefits and other state priorities, um, including agricultural uses, natural areas, and headwater protection, flood and climate resilience, wildlife habitat, outdoor recreation, and community development. Um, the recommendation shall also consider opportunities to leverage federal and other non state funds. And the stakeholder group shall include the following the secretaries of ag and natural resources the executive director of bhcb the president of vermont land trust the, um, the vermont and new hampshire director of the trust for public land the state director of the nature conservancy do you want dozen knees written in there or are you guys going to show up at all these meetings here on your own I can't speak for everybody, so it doesn't mean it's appropriate. Yeah. Um, also, we don't typically call out specific, not NGOs in a statute. I guess I'm a little, are we inviting them or directing them? <laughs> <laughs> so what I would, I would say something like it would include a representative of the Vermont Land Trust to be appointed by the Land Trust, and you do things like that. VHCB is often referenced. See, they're a little bit different, but I just, I guess I've not seen it done that they call out specific mm -hmm. non-profits. That's, that's fine. I can come up with generalized language that would achieve the same purpose. <laughs> I guess you're telling me I just, it hasn't happened in my time here, but it happens. It happens. Okay. I guess if they've all agreed. Is anyone going to come to the party later and wish we invited them? You're all in the room. Who's <laughs> <laughs> not in the room right now? <laughs> I was just, sorry, I was just Page 33, line 5, uh, it should be conservation, not conversation. Okay, so I'm wondering if there's a way to, uh, uh, I don't know how you include what Phil just said about others. I mean, there are people who just don't happen to be here and they want to be part of this. And I think it's just out there. And I, I guess. I also wonder about 
well, considering opportunities to leverage federal and other non-federal funds for conservation as part of the, um, we're making a strategic land conservation recommendation. They're recommending how to prioritize the funding of, of conservation. Right. Funding of conservation. Okay, you know, recommending framework for state land recommendation. You know. Yeah, I guess that's fine. It just seems like funding comes and funding goes, and Vermont should have priorities that are separate from dollars that are associated with it. If we're actually planning for meaningful land conservation, what's the thinking behind including that? I think part of the thinking is that you know, I could offer a tiny bit of good news. We have an opportunity to add two million dollars to support our farmland work if we can raise the match for it. So I think the thinking is that among the considerations are is are we going to leave federal resources on the table or not, and that that's something that you would want to know as we come up with a plan to figure out where to <coughs> put resources. Any thoughts? Any other thoughts on this section? So earlier the committee heard me say slam dunk and I stick by that. But I'm also so this is this is more an inquiry as to a possibility. This will should it pass and should it make it through all the process will become law of effective date mm, seven, uh, July 1st, uh, 2020. I'd like this input to this bill when it says, and, uh, and um, there may very well reasonably be an opportunity, a chance that this bill isn't going to get through the whole process by the end of this semester, and that the results of this stakeholder group would be available to us next January, and could then inform this bill uh, for for the House sake and for the Senate sake. And so, so then, then the question is of actually the stakeholders here: What do you? Do, do you need a letter from us asking you to do this um, and, and get it done by the same date, uh, by, by uh, January 15, 2020, so then we can incorporate it into this bill? And that's what I would see as being ideal. Um, and I don't know what the, what the precedent for our doing something like that. I think we've asked for stuff, of course. So it's in the bill, but we're also asking, but we're really asking to get the results of this study done by that same day, January 15, 2020. Well, I think we're hoping it passes. I mean, you're okay with January 2020. I mean, yeah. Your concern is if we don't pass the bill this session. Mm, uh, no. <laughs> I think what I'm my what I'm trying to um, say is, yep, the results of that study, with this bill passing, are not going to be in, are not going to inform this bill. Do you want them to convene <laughs> now yes. and recommend to you before the end of this session? Before January 15, 2020, this, this bill, not, and this be, because right now this bill comes, uh, shall it take effect on July 1st, 2020, actually, because 2019 is 
Am I crazy? This is 2019. <laughs> we wanted to take a picture. Your numbers are wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this bill is. It's 2019. <laughs> Trust him. Your concern is if the bill doesn't pass, then your concern is valid. And, right. And you have in the past, when things have broken down like that, you have written letters to request that they go forward with these groups without the specific legislative directive. Yeah. But it's a little early for that, I would say. So. Okay. Thoughts on the on this? Any other thoughts on this section? Harvey. Yeah, no, I, I just looking at the section with the, the group and the stakeholders group, you know, you're talking about meeting water quality standards and uh, mm -hmm. we need to have a, a strategic uh, um, yeah. land conservation uh, proposal. And yet, part of that should include folks that own land. You know, their stakeholders in this, and they're missing from here. And I think when we started talking about the water quality projects, we had, you know, a lot of uh, um, watershed groups, you know, set up and formed, and they did incredible work on trying to figure out their piece of the puzzle. And I, I think if we're going to continue with that idea, they need to be part of this as well. I don't know how, I mean, you can invite them. You can't demand that they be there. But um, I, I think that they're part of the, the solution to the puzzle we're trying to solve or put together. Any thoughts on, on what Harvey just said and why they're not included, first of all? Is that How to include them, Representative McCullough? Yeah, um, what what I already said. I mean, and, and Michael, I think, might be reworking this, and it's what I would call, and shall include all the usual suspects. And then Michael, you know, puts them out here, such as these guys are, and it should, it might include two representatives of of uh, Vermont <coughs> landowners or something too, as well as... Well, I think they need to be more than landowners. I think they need to be part of a group that has been actively involved in trying to solve the water quality problem. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, what kind of group are you thinking of? Well, I was thinking person? of the Champlain Valley Farmers Coalition. There's one up in mm -hmm. Franklin mm -hmm. County that's been working on this for longer than we have been. Right. trying to do what they can with their limited resources to clean up the waters of the state. I think they're the ones that have some experience. I think that they should be included. And then you have the conservation districts who have been on it. I didn't see whether they were listed or not, but I mean, they work with those groups all the time. So I, I think that those are, you know, just uh, come to mind pretty easily. Yeah. And we're we're talking specifically about this section, right? Land yeah. conservation. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I, I think what Representative Smith he makes a great point. You know, Farmers Watershed Alliances and uh, Champlain Valley and the other examples are terrific um, knowledge base of landowners that have been participating. Um, whether they, you know, I think, inviting them to participate makes sense because they, I know, work very closely with some of these conservation groups already and they may be able to shed the light on, um, you know, a perspective, off a perspective that would be very meaningful. Yeah, and then I have another question that kind of goes along with Jim stimulated my thought on this one is how we're going to use it because by the time we get a report back from this group, we're going to be into doing our next step. So how's that, how's it going to be used? 
What are the folks who came up with this idea and then this, this being useful? So I, I think the objective here was mm -hmm. to have a conversation outside the legislature about broader land conservation objectives that both agencies of agriculture and natural resources are trying to promote both for water quality functions and the other functions and values that VHCB and, and the participant organizations are uh, do as a part of their conservation efforts. And then we would take that information back to help really in the context of the, the capital process to help prioritize what the priorities were for land conservation in the state. And I think that was the objective that we were looking to, to try and focus where we're spending dollars on land conservation. I think the other thing is to work collaboratively to um, enhance our ability to accomplish both um, a quantifiable pollution reduction value. I mean, there are lots of things land conservation does that have net benefits to pollution reduction, but there's a, that part, but there's also non pollution reduction benefits associated with it. So helping the VHCB, I think there's a mutual helping that's going to take place as far as um, us giving some guidance to the people acquiring the land on how we quantify these targets so that their work can be counted better. And then also working with places like the Chesapeake Bay where they're looking at conversion and how much uh, preventing conversion of forest land or ag land to development, how much that can get counted as a pollution reduction effort under the sort of TMDLC to work in the Chesapeake Bay. And so we're working collaboratively on those types of issues. Um, so I don't, I mean, I don't necessarily have any disagreement about broadening the scope, but I do think that this is going to be um, sort of at a higher sort of level, more about how land conservation efforts are feeding into agency programs and missions, I, and then that, that we can come back with sort of a strategic plan or vision to the legislature for how then those funding priorities could take place. And I think that's that's how our vision, I don't know if you, guys, if you agree or want to add. Uh, well, I would just say, going to the chair's question, this grew out of a conversation with Secretary Moore last uh, Thursday afternoon or with uh, Billy Coster Friday morning, just looking at that point because the language we proposed to you was not acceptable to them, but how do we bridge the divide? And I think for all the reasons that we just heard Matt articulate, um, and in my testimony, that we achieve multiple public goods when we conserve land, and this bill is focused on one of those goods to reduce phosphorus. But how do you balance that with public recreation benefits, with benefits to the ag community, um, with benefits for wildlife habitat, with benefits when a parcel of land that we can conserve doesn't flow into an area with the TMD? No. So it was just let's step back and have a conversation about all of those public goods and and the state of Vermont, from my perspective, do more than one bit at a time. So um, and. I would absolutely agree with Representative Smith that the watershed groups and conservation districts are very important to this overall conversation. If you want to add them in here, that's fine. If you want to, I don't know. I do not know the breadth of the bill well enough to know if there's another place where you can enhance their input into the process as well. Um, but I, I agree with you completely that they. Add mightily to our work, our fund viability program works with them regularly as we work with farmers. Uh, one of the slides I showed you um, last week, a farmer got into the BMP program specifically because of the, the referral the land trust made to the conservation district folks. Smith, I was just thinking of. Uh, you know, trying to find ways to, because um, this is the group that's been quite creative in there, and they, they should have a place at the table. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what that place would be. And uh, I can see that uh, 
this now with Matt's explanation, it you know takes on a little different light to me, but they still need to be somehow part of that conversation at some level. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm open to how that could happen, but I'm I'm just saying that it should happen. And then I'm kind of wondering about the timing of this in relation to this bill. It almost looks like a separate separate yeah. action item. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is this, Mr. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. 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 I was. Yeah. In, I'm thinking. Thank you. Are these helping me articulate what I so inarticulately articulate? And that is the action step. And so on line six, page thirty-three. If the, th this should be, at, in order to accomplish a real action step here, it should be January 15th, 2019. Well, it it's a little late for that. December, <laughs> you're thinking December 15th, 2019. So, but it, 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 the point being, it, I guess I would run out of time. I would just say that remember, this is, it's actually been, we've been moving it towards more of an iterative process. It, we're all kind of learning and growing as we increase the funding to water quality work. I don't necessarily, yes, in one hand, they may feel separate, but I don't, yeah. it's going to give us information to further this conversation. Which may result in further legislation. Right. What changes, right. Yeah. So I think it's fair to say it's not. Yeah, I'm Nothing's seeing, written in stone. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, uh, I'm back to the future. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Does that change? Do you want to add anything? Representative Dolan, do you want to? No, I'm fine. Okay. So I think Harvey you brought up a great point. I think it, we're. I'm, I agree with you. I don't know even how or who or how they'd want to engage. And I think noodling on that a little would be helpful. Um, it isn't, I mean, it, it is a conservation plan, and these are the statewide players typically thought of in that, in that frame of statewide conservation work. Um, um, rather than focusing on representation to help s resolve a, you know, uh, the discussion that we've had in the past week or so between um, the Mount Housing Conservation Board and the agency about conservation, perhaps a, a better solution or another option would be to revisit the council itself. And here in the council, based on the watershed, that's where we would want that kind of voice to help in the decision making and ranking of projects at that watershed scale. So here, as you remember, on, on back on page um, 13 of the new draft, line 13, section G, we, we introduced that Basin Water Quality Council. And, uh, and I know we were trying to, somewhat constrained in trying to keep the size to a reasonable number, but here we identify on page starting on 14, the various entities that would be part of the whole process, similar to what we've heard from Vicki Drew, similar to that state technical committee rankings. Here you have on a regional scale this water quality council made okay, up of your, representatives. Right. Your, so my, my, my point is that perhaps this is where we can call out a, um, a farmer watershed group, whether it's the Champlain Valley um, Farmers Coalition or the uh, Farmers Alliance as a watershed based agricultural entity of sorts. Yeah, that's a, yeah, a good concept, and I like that. There's one underlying problem, though, is uh, they don't normally have staff, paid staff, that's able to do this, so it would be asking somebody to give up a day or more uh, in order to volunteer their time and effort to. To deal with that, and that's always an issue in the agriculture and forestry community. Fine, because there just isn't any, any way to fund those. So, you know, trying to find a, a little way of um, 
an equitable way to help them at the table as well. Well, you may recall that on um, the lines where we talked about the 500,000 set aside, that includes participation in these, count in these councils. So okay, I think we're getting into something that, that felt um, pretty so. Conservation districts were already added to that group of folks, and um, I think uh, what I'd like us to do is take a short break, and I'd like the committee to kind of uh, go away and figure out how close you are on this bill and what, is, what are the changes you need to um, make it work. Um, and I guess we could ask you to make the changes we already just made. They won't be done by the end of today. Okay. Um, so let's take a break and then come back in a minute. 